Hey guys, and welcome to the first video in the series where we're going through this book, Logical Chess Move by Move. Now, hopefully you've already ordered this and you've gone through game one, like I mentioned in the previous video. If you haven't, that's okay. You're gonna have time to catch up. It's gonna be a long series because there's like 30 something games in this book. And if you don't wanna order the book or you don't wanna read it or whatever, that's okay. I'm still gonna be highlighting a lot of the key points and key principles, and this is gonna be a great series where you're gonna have a lot of takeaways regardless. You're just gonna get a little bit more out of it if you are going through the book with us, okay? So if you have questions, comments, anything about you know reading this that you wanna mention, put it in the comments. I'm gonna do my best to respond to those and answer those in the following video. So when we talk about game number two next time, if there's any important questions that you know weren't answered, I'll address those as well, okay? So let me go ahead and give you a little intro here. The book is broken into three sections, okay? And the first section of the book deals with king side attacks okay so if you're attacking on the king side what what do you need to know and there's one very important thing that was said right in the the introduction even before we got into game number one so for those of you who have read the book i would like to ask you when you're thinking about attacking on the king side what is the number one thing that you need to think about all right well for those of you who read the book that's a pretty easy question and the answer is if these three pawns have not moved and the knight on f3 is still there, it's gonna be very difficult to attack that king, okay? When the pawns are in a perfect line like this, they cover all of these squares, there's no weaknesses, they do a great job of defending the king, and then when the knight is there, it also is a nice defender. Notice how it stops the queen from coming in, it blocks off things like this and like this, defends on h2, it's a very solid setup. And so the key point, even before we got into game number one, the key point, is that when one of those things changes, maybe the knight moves away, the knight moves back over to d2, or maybe the pawn goes to h3 to stop the bishop from coming in, or whatever the case may be, maybe this pawn moves to g3. Whenever something changes about that setup, that should be a signal to you like, oh, I need to start thinking about attacking on the king side now, because now there's a weakness, or there's a you know not as many pieces defending, or whatever the case may be. So that was kind of the key, key takeaway right at the, the beginning. Okay, so just keep that in mind as we go through this game. We're going to see a very clear example of that as, as we get into this. Actually, the next move here, white plays h3, which, based on what I just said, should tell you, okay, let's start thinking about how do we attack on the king side. And that might seem hard, like, hard to figure out how to do right now. That's why we're going through this game. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'm going to jump back to the beginning. We're going to go through this game together. And I highlighted 15 key principles that were mentioned in this book. There was more that was mentioned than just 15 things, but these are the 15 that jumped out at me that I think are important that I wanna reiterate, okay? So let's go through this game and I'm gonna talk about those 15 principles as we go through, okay? So here we go. E4, E5, knight to F3, which attacks the pawn. This brings us to principle number one, develop your knights before your bishops. Usually the knights are gonna to go to F3 and C3, and c6 and f6, okay? You, you kind of know where the knights are gonna go. So it makes sense to develop them first, get a little bit more information from your opponent about what they're gonna do before you decide on where you wanna put your bishops. Because the bishops, it's, the, it's not so clear like where the best square is gonna be for them, right? Depending on what your opponent does, you might choose any one of these four squares, okay? So knights before bishops, that's the first principle. Let's keep going. Black also follows that principle as well. And number two is if you have an option to defend a piece and develop at the same time, you should do it, right? See, a lot of people here would be like, ah, my pawn's being attacked. Let me just defend it like this. The problem with that is you're not developing a piece, right? Remember, the knights and the bishops are the pieces that you have to get off the back rank as quickly as possible. So if you can do that at the same time, that's usually going to be your best move. All right, let's keep going. Actually, no, there's one more principle here. And this third principle is kind of just like a something to keep in the back of your mind as we go through the rest of them. But it's, these principles are great guideposts, right? So you, once you learn all these principles, you wanna kinda of keep them in the back of your mind as like, okay, this is generally speaking what I should do, but know that there are, there's always gonna be a time to break those principles. This is not like you always do this, like you always develop your knights before your bishops, and you always defend when you, and develop a piece at the same time, and you, you always, no, no, no. It's like most of the time you do that, and sometimes you're gonna to have to break the rule. Okay, and that's just part of getting better at chess. But the first step is to learning what the principles are. Okay, let's keep going. So bishop to c4. Bishop to c4 takes us into the Italian game. Very common opening here. 
And the next principle that I wrote down is that the best attacking piece is the king's bishop. And this is something that I had never really thought of as a principle. I just kind of intuitively know that like, hey, this can be very dangerous and it opens up a lot of attacking opportunities. But thinking of it as a principle, I think is, is smart. This is one of the best attacking pieces that you have if you're playing an e4 opening as white. And it's because the king, the black king starts on a light square. And very quickly, you can sacrifice this and lure the king out if you want to, right? The four move checkmate also happens this way, where the bishop and the queen team up and you can checkmate the king, right? So very, very good attacking piece. Just keep that in mind. And what does that mean for black? It means you have to be careful. Like, hey, this could be dangerous, right? So keep that in the back of your mind as well. All right, let's keep going. Bishop to c5, black is essentially doing the same thing. And this is also dangerous for white. Same, same concept, right? And this brings us to principles number five and six. So number five is that you want to place each piece on the best possible square as quickly as you can. So bishop to c5 is a very good square for the bishop for reasons we just talked about. But notice black didn't go to e7 first and then later go to c5. They didn't go here and then come back and, you know, go here and then go. He just immediately. You want to, as, as quickly as you can, get to the, the right square. This is something that I see beginners do all the time. They think that they have, like, plenty of time. They think, like, oh, yeah, you know what? I'll do it later. Let me do something else for now, and I'll get that bishop there eventually. And they don't understand the urgency, right? The urgency of, like, as quickly as possible, you have to get those pieces to the best squares. That's something that grandmasters do very, very well. If you ever played against a grandmaster, it's like, man... How did they accomplish so much? Like, we're only on move like seven and they have like all these pieces like ready to checkmate me. Like, how did that happen? Well, it's because they don't waste time and they know exactly where they want their pieces to be and they get them there as quickly as possible, okay? Now, number six is related. Principle number six is related. You don't want to move your pieces more than one time in the opening, okay? So you don't want to be moving, like I just said, here and then here. One time. Move it there, you're done. Move on to the next piece, okay? Let's keep going. So white plays C3. This is a good idea, obviously, to strike at the center. You lose the uh, ability to put the knight there, so it's a trade-off, but it does allow the queen as well. And let's keep going. Queen to e7. Castles kingside. And this brings us principle number seven. Try to castle early in the game, preferably on the kingside. Okay? It's easier to castle kingside because you don't have to get the queen out of the way. It's also nice that the king is just perfectly situated behind the three pawns. When you castle queenside, sometimes it's awkward with this guy being undefended because the king doesn't defend it. So just something to keep in mind, but castling kingside is great. And that brings us to, like we talked about earlier, this is the theme for all of these games, right? How do you attack on the kingside? We're going to see that. Let's keep going. D6, lets the bishop out. It's a great move. A, uh, let's see, A4, yeah, so this is kind of a tricky moment in the game, and I want to talk a little bit about this. So what is white doing here? At first glance, it's like, well, it seems like they want to attack the bishop, but we have two pieces defending that and only one here, so I don't really see what white is doing. Well, if we were to go here, there's actually a little trap. They could play A5, and when we take it, you guys see the move that white has. If you haven't read the book and you'd like to pause, you can pause right here. All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, it's rook takes a5, followed by queen to a4 check, which is a fork, and now you're going to lose your bishop. So let's say you block and you lose the bishop. Now, the thing that you need to understand about this is that getting two pieces for a rook and a pawn is a good trade for white, okay? Because if you do the math, you say, well, these are worth three and three, that's six points, this is five and one, that's six. It should be equal, right? It's pretty, it should be even. But he talks about in the book that you get two pieces for a rook, and he's kind of assuming that you understand two pieces is better than a rook and a pawn. Okay, so I just want to point that out. And why, why is that the case? Let's move forward with this. Why is this the case that this is better for, for white than for black? A lot of it has to do with the fact that rooks are endgame pieces. They can't be used early in the game. They're just they're stuck in the corner. It takes time for them to get into the game and become effective, whereas the knight and the bishop can immediately start playing a role in putting pressure on black. And a lot of times what happens in these kind of situations is you don't even survive to the end game, right? Because the knight and the bishop is so much power, more powerful in the middle game. And even if you do survive to the end game, there's no guarantee that you're even going to have a better position. The knight and bishop are still very, very effective. So that's why, generally speaking, knights and bishops are better than, than the rook and the pawn. And if you have an opportunity to do something like this, you should. But in this game, black sees what's happening. 
And instead of playing knight to f6, they deal with the threat by playing a6. Now, this brings us to the next principle here. Um, actually, sorry, two more principles. And uh, I want to, let's see, uh, sorry, the number, yeah, number nine. Okay, so principle number eight was the, the two pieces for the rook and the pawn. Principle number nine is that you want to develop all your pieces before starting any tricky combinations. And white in this game actually doesn't do that. Okay, they got a couple pieces out and they castled, which was good. But then they left these guys sitting on the back and they started to just attack without finishing their development. And they're, they're not following that principle. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Try to get all your pieces out first before you launch an attack like this. Okay, so they play a5. And then black plays bishop to a7. Now, of course, principle number 10 here is that you always want to deal with the threats first and then continue your development. Sometimes beginners, they get on autopilot of like, just develop, 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 and, and you don't respond to the threat, right? Here, playing a developing move like knight f6 would actually be a very bad move because you're just giving up your bishop for free. So deal with the major threats first and then finish the development, okay? So that's what black does, simply retreats. Game goes on. Now, h3 is played by white, okay? So the very first thing that I said in this introduction here was what? As soon as you see the three pawns in the knight configuration change, like we see here, that should be a signal of like, okay, this could be a weakness, right? This could be something that I can use to attack. Okay, and that's what you need to be thinking about as soon as you see that move, okay? So h3. And this brings me to principle number 11, which is that each pawn that you move in front of your king weakens the position. So I would like you to to pause here and tell me what is the weakness that is created by the move h3? Well, hopefully you said g3, right? This square is no longer defended. See, previously it's defended by this pawn. And you might say, well, this pawn too, right? No, actually not, because look carefully here. Well, well temporarily, yes, it is defended, but that could very easily become a problem for white as soon as this pawn moves, which we're gonna see later in the game. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but there's really only this guy which is defending that square in a, in a meaningful manner, right? Because of the bishop is here. So as soon as you play h3, now this is a crucial weakness, okay? And we're gonna see that as we continue to go through this, all right? So that's the weakness. And he mentioned something here that I wanna point out. He said, always try to keep three pawns in front of your castled king on their original squares as long as possible. Now, the fact that he says as long as possible kind of implies that, look, there's gonna come a moment in the game where you're gonna to have to move one of them, probably. You're gonna to have to move one of the pawns, you're gonna to have to move one of the knight, the knight away at some point, right? But as long as possible, try to keep him there. And usually, that's gonna be really, really good for you. And then when you finally do have to move it, hopefully, uh, you're just in such a great position at that point that it's not gonna be a crucial weakness. In this position, white could have very easily done something else. You could have developed your bishop, you could have de developed your knight, you could have tried to get the rook into the game. You didn't have to play it here. Uh, and yet white went ahead and did it, right? So he didn't really follow that principle. Okay, let's keep going. Knight to f6. Okay, he's developing, he's attacking. That's great. And this brings us to another principle, principle number 12. Whenever you can develop a piece and attack at the same time, that's a really good thing to do. And that's what black is doing here. So that's great. Let's keep going. White takes. Now, another principle here, principle number 13, is that open lines are to the advantage of the player who has more development. So in this position, who has more development? Well, let's see. White has one, two, and then you could say castling is a developing move, so I would say three. How about black? Well, one, two, three, and the queen is developed too and putting pressure on the center. So really black has four, white only has three, and yet white makes the decision to start opening up the lines. And that that diagonal that I talked about now, you can see, right? This is a very weak square. And also the D file is potentially gonna be open as well. So white is doing something, opening these lines, but they're not developed enough. So you don't really wanna do that, right? So black decides to capture with the knight. Okay. And knight takes E5. Now, principle number 14 is the best defense. This is kind of related to what we talked about, but the best defender of white's king side is the knight on f3, right? Which, which is what we talked about. And now he's giving it up. So you see the h3 move earlier. 
Now you see the knight gets traded away. And so two things have changed about that super solid kingside position, right? And this is, again, where black should be saying like, oh, red flags are going off in my mind now of like, hey, I got to attack that kingside. It's it's weak. It is, it is no longer that, that initial setup, okay? So black captures with the queen. White plays knight to d2. And this brings us to principle number 15, which is um, whoever controls the center has better chances of attacking, okay? And if you look at this position, I would say black... It, you could say white has some control. You've got the bishop here. You've got the pawn. You've got the knight. But black really has a lot of control. You've got this guy. You've got the knight. You've got the pawn. You've got the queen. And I would say black has a little bit more control over, over the center. Okay? And because of that, black is feeling comfortable to try to launch an attack. Okay? All right. So um, it is now black's turn. White has just played knight to d2. And for those of you who haven't read the book yet, I would like you to pause. And how do you think black uh, was able to attack White's king from this position right here. All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, actually a stunning move if you're not uh, ready for it. Bishop takes h3. And here we go. That h3 pawn being moved forward, now we can see how it really is going to cost white in this position, right? And why is why is uh, black doing this? Well, let's take a look. It captures what's the follow-up move here black to play a really powerful move get a chance to look at that the move is queen to g3 check and again going back to the bishop here the pawn is not playing a role and the fact that this guy has been moved forward allows the queen to come in imagine if this pawn was still back on h2 this would not be a move that black could play or you would simply take the queen but because it has been moved the weakness is created and now white's king is in trouble all right king to h1 Captures another pawn with check. King has to move back. If you would like to pause again, how does black continue the attack here? Get a chance to look at that. The move is knight to g4. Simply threatening checkmate here on h2. And it's not easy for white to stop. White decides to play knight to f3, which does temporarily defend the threat. But black still has powerful moves. What do you think the move that was played next is? Get a chance to look at that. That's correct. Queen to g3 check. Again, taking advantage of that pin. You can see how effective this bishop has been this game along that diagonal there. King to h1. And then black simply captures the pawn. And black is doing very, very well. Now, there's something interesting here. This is basically where he kind of ends the discussion, says it's it's good for black. There's something that I noticed, um, which was that white actually has a way to save the game. Now, before I talk about that, I, I just want to kind of step back and just recap what we just talked about. The, the age three move, trading the knight, created the weaknesses right around the king, and then black was able to take advantage of it with the sacrifice. The queen came in, he had control over the center, he had a little bit of a lead in development, and, and white's position kind of fell apart. That being said, even after all of this, there is a stunning move here. Bishop takes f7, and if you take this, white has queen to d5 check, and there's actually a perpetual check here where wherever you go, the queen just keeps checking you. The queen just keeps checking you. And if you try to run away, you might actually lose because now white's the one who launches an attack. Now, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because I want you to, to pay attention to the fact that even when you have a good position and even when you are attacking, you still have to watch out for the counterattack, right? And so actually, if you're curious, and, and I don't know if this was not included in the book because it wasn't found or because it just didn't fit with the lesson, whatever the case may be. But the actual best move for black in this position right here was actually just to castle queenside, get the king to safety first, and then you can continue the attack later. And, and the game is going to go on. It's still a very good position for black. So it, it tricky position. I just wanted to point that out. But the takeaway from this game, Kingside attack, as soon as you see something change about the position, in this case it was h3, that's when you want to start thinking about attacking on the king side. Okay, so very, very good lesson there. Again, later we saw the knight move away. Bishop sacrifice, beautiful game. Please, guys, let me know. Comments down below, things that you feel like weren't clear, questions that you have. All right, so homework for next time is going to be game number two, which is pages 19 through 23. And if you can try to have that red 
two weeks from now, which would be April 12th. All right, April 12th, uh, game number two. And, and for right now, guys, we're going to stick with every two weeks. If it's too slow and people are really enjoying it and we want to pick up the pace, maybe we can jump to every week. But for right now, I'm just going with every two weeks, and we'll see how that goes, okay? All right, guys, so thank you so much for watching. Make sure to let me know if you have questions, things you want to talk about or discuss. Put them in the comments below, and I'm going to do my best to look through those and answer those. If I don't answer them directly in the comments, I'll probably try to do something in the next video. All right, thank you guys, and I'll see you next time. Stay sharp, play smart, and take care.